Good morning, how are you? I'm Lorraine, I'm Lorraine Kelly, and this session is all about social mobility. It is called Blow the Bloody Doors Off, which I think is a great title. I have to say it is kind of something of a miracle that I'm actually standing here talking to you and that I've been on your screens for 35 years now because my TV career was almost over before it actually began. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but being working class when I started out meant a lot of doors, we're talking about doors today, a lot of doors in telly were firmly closed to me. But I didn't know it. I remember earlier in my career, I received a wake up call that really brought home the class divide that still exists. Um, I was born in the east end of Glasgow, um, in the Gorbals, in 1959, and back then, one of the poorest and most deprived areas in Europe. <coughs> my mum and dad taught me to read and write before I went to primary school. And they made sure that I inherited their work ethic. And I always knew, it was always within me, that I wanted to be a journalist. So, when I was 17, I turned down a place at university and I got a job at my local newspaper as a trainee. Now, my mum and dad, really weren't happy at all because I would have been the first one in the family to get a degree and they would have had that, you know the photo? You know that, look at me there, look at me there. I'm sorry, I look half drunk, don't I? Look at the phone, kids, that's what we had to do, that's what we had to put up with. Back then you had to get up off your bum and change the channel, there was no, there was none of this. It was hell, it was hell. But they would have had, you know, the, the, the picture with the hat and the scroll, um, which was a huge, huge deal back then for every working class family that wanted a better life for their children. But instead, I joined the East Kilbride News, I absolutely loved it, I worked there for about five years. And then I thought I wanted to have a challenge and I would try to get a job with the BBC. Now, my dad was a telly repair man, which was the closest that I came to knowing anybody at all connected with television. But a lack of connections didn't stop me applying to BBC Scotland for every single job that was going. Um, I even applied to be farming correspondent up in Aberdeen, and I didn't know one end of a cow from another. But I basically actually wore them down and I got taken on as a researcher in the Glasgow newsroom. Big, big deal. I worked really hard, I volunteered for everything, and I was always the one that was sent out to do vox pops, you know, for the end of, you know, the and finally at the end of the news that you used to do. Because the editors always said, punters will talk to you, you're one of them. And actually, I found that and took that as a massive, massive compliment. Well, one day I got called into the big boss's office and I thought this is it because I knew there was an on-screen reporter's job going and I thought this is it, this is my big moment, I'm going to get the job of my dreams. Didn't quite turn out like that. I will never forget this, he sort of, he was sitting there and he, he had these glasses on and he sort of pushed them down his nose and he kind of looked up at me and sighed, you know, really wearily and he said, you're never going to make it in television, never. Your accent, it's, it's appalling. In fact, he actually told me that my accent, my Glasgow accent was offensive. Yeah. And this is from a Scottish person. Anyway, I was utterly crushed. You know, I really was. Now, it has to be said, back then, we're talking 1984, it's a long time ago, nobody presenting on telly spoke like me or like Anton Deck or like Eamon, lovely Eamon Holmes. TV types, especially newsreaders, they were posh or at least they were posh compared to the likes of me. I mean, I remember when people read the news, we had an amazing newsreader called Mary Marquis, who was an ex-actress, and she was fantastic, she was beautiful, immaculate, and you know, when she spoke, it was just like pearls falling out of her mouth. She was incredible, and that was kind of who you saw on the telly. Well, I didn't know what to do, actually. I, I thought, you know, I really was, when I say I was crushed, I, I really was, and it's actually quite hard sometimes to think back on it, because I remember that, that young girl, you know, having her dreams completely destroyed, but, as luck would have it, that same week I heard that a job had opened up on TVAM, I don't know if you remember TVAM, um, as a Scottish correspondent. So I sort of gathered up what was left of my self-esteem and went down to London for the audition and believe it or not, I got the job. Now, that was only because the big boss was Australian and they don't care about class. He wanted a Scottish reporter that sounded Scottish and as far as he was concerned, my Glasgow accent was a positive, it really was. I also though, I worked for a fantastic <laughs> news editor called Bill Ludford, now Bill was from the north of England and a real champion, sort of behind the scenes and very quietly, a champion of reporters who were working class because he was himself and he wanted to give us a hand up and I always think that that's what we should all be doing. 
He also gave me the chance of being a presenter on TVAM after I reported on the Lockerbie bombing in 1988. And as you all know, since then, there have been many different sofas, many regime changes, um, and I'm still here. And you would think by now that I would feel like I belong in Teleland. But to be honest, after being told that early that my accent and essentially my background and, and who I was would prevent me from being successful in TV, it's always made me feel that I'm kind of on the outside and maybe I'm not quite good enough. And it's tough, it's tough to shake that off. It really is, it's quite hard, but I'm still here. I do remember when I was working at GMTV and there was this really posh Tory MP, posher even than Rees Mogg, he really was. And I asked him a, a particularly tricky question and I'll never forget it, he sort of drawled that he couldn't understand what I was saying. This is on live telly, so I can't understand what you're saying. Now, looking back, I think that was a tactic because he couldn't or wouldn't answer a difficult question but it was extremely patronising. It was also very effective because it made me feel really, really small. And it also affected my confidence as it would when you're first starting out. I also remember at TVAM, we were all sent out to do travel reports back then. And my fellow presenters, I remember one got a trip on Concord, one went to the Seychelles, one went to Australia, it was all very glam. And I got sent on a coach trip with old age pensioners to Bavaria. And it was, it was as grim as it sounds. But you know, as I was told, kept getting told you've got punter appeal. That's what I was always told. Um, I've also been in meetings though, many, many years ago. Um, and I really hope this doesn't happen anymore. It certainly doesn't, doesn't happen where I work. Where my audience were referred to as Tracy Tower Block. Now that was scandalous and I was so furious because it's so patronising. They were talking about my aunt, my, my granny, my mum, my friends, my audience. And I never ever forget when I'm presenting my show, not everybody has got a car or a garden. Not everybody can afford to go on holiday abroad. At the same time though, I would never patronise the less well of people in my audience because they're really smart and they're not to be underestimated or taken for granted. And I'm really, really proud of where I'm from. And despite being slapped down a few times for being working class, I reckon it's actually been my best asset and maybe the key to being around for so long for my longevity. But I treat everybody who comes on the show exactly the same. Uh, people who watch feel that they know me and they can relate to me and that I'm one of them. And to be honest with you, that's a real honor. I do, however, really worry that there aren't enough people like me on the telly doing the kind of job that I do or working in management and production. And those doors that we're talking about, those doors really need to be blown up and opened up. And that's why I really am so delighted about this brilliant RTS bursary scheme. It's helping to tackle and improve social mobility by supporting students who, like me, came from less well-off backgrounds. Some of them are here today and I'd really like to talk to them because you can listen to me <laughs> rabbiting on, but they're far more important. So I'm just going to go over and have a wee chat with them first of all. It's great to see you guys, thank you. Thank you for coming to this. Are you enjoying it so far? It's been okay, it's been okay. Sarah. First of all, if I could talk to you, you're from Ireland, from Northern Ireland, yes, yeah. yeah. And you were a young teenage mum. Um, I had my son more um, at the age of 28. Right, right. Um, so at that point, I sort of um, stepped into the benefits life. Right, okay. What age are you now? I'm 39. You're 39? Gosh, yes. you don't look 39. Can you be on my show and we'll do a whole segment about how you look so young? That's for another time. But that's amazing. So you felt as if the, the, your dreams, it, it kind of passed you by, did they? Um, most definitely. So I probably, a bit of a late bloomer, I realised my dream later in life. But coming from a working class background, um, sort of script writing or producing, that was never going to make money. Right. So your parents have a tendency to want you to go into an office job, if you're lucky, um, and make, make money because sure. that just seems more logical. Yeah. But with regard to what makes you happy or your dream, what's going to feed you, um, you know, I had to push and uh, go forward and try and do what I really, really yeah. love. Um, but that just, it wasn't happening. And I sort of, I even tried to do that as a contributor on a couple of shows. <laughs> okay. um, and although that gave me experience behind the camera and I could see, it never really sort of um, made me contacts or pushed me forward. It was enjoyable. So I knew um, I could only get waitressing jobs and I knew I had to go back to education. Mm. And the best thing about doing that is becoming an RTS bursary student. So what difference has that made to you? 
huge because I actually do feel like I'm part of a family. I feel supported. Right. Um, do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody that you can talk not to? Not just yet. So right. I'm going into my um, second year of university and um, that's going to become available to me in this year. Fantastic. So Anne's working hard <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie and Megan, the rest of the team. Oh, that's brilliant. It's, it's really so good. Helpful. Ultimately, what's the dream? Um, so most of my experience is script writing, but I would love to produce. Right. Um, I would like to have as many strings to my bow as possible because I know that um, uh, being able to work in any job that's offered to me is, yeah. is obviously going to um, just uh, make opportunity. It's better. about experience, about gaining experience and all of the experiences in your life, you know, being a, being a mum, mm -hmm. working hard, working as a waitress, I've done that as well. Um, it helps you, it helps you. And you, the thing about you is you can communicate and that's, that's really, really important. It really is. I wish you all the best. Thank you so I much. I really do. I really do. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Amish, now you, for you, it's more on the tech side for you, isn't it? Yeah. So what has this meant for you being part of this um, birthday party? Basically, so I study engineering at university. Right. So for me, it's, um, I've never really looked at television as a side. I've done things on the side creatively right. um, that I've enjoyed doing, but I've never really looked at it in terms of a career. So this summer I was able to tour 10 companies in TV and I was able to see that there is quite a lot of opportunities here. Right. Normally people in my industry are quite naive. They think of Google, Facebook as the first like industry to go into. You sure. don't realize that TV actually has a lot of opportunities here. So that's been really interesting for me. So yeah. I, I'm, looking quite, I'm looking forward to it now that there is a lot of people looking out for people like me that mm -hmm. are not just in the creative side, but didn't have a technical background. <laughs> so well, we yeah. can't do it without you. <laughs> <laughs> we really yeah. can't, so we need you. And ultimately, what do you think you would like to do? Um, at the moment, I'm unsure. I'm going into my second year of university now. So um, at the moment, I am really unsure, but I don't think engineering might not be for me. So mm -hmm. uh, after touring the companies this summer, I've, I've realized there's like a lot of op opportunities open up in television. So I'm looking forward to applying for internships uh, in the following summer. So. I think that's going to be my main exploration Good. this time around. Yeah. And don't take no for an answer. Keep yeah, plugging no, away. That's I'm, what I'm I did. Keep going. You have to. You have yeah. to just become a pest. That's yeah. what I did. And eventually, eventually you'll get there. You will. Donald, the thing about you is you're, you're studying up in Stirling, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. There was nobody really like you. You were saying to me that you didn't feel as if you had a role model. No, yeah. It's someone from my background, not only like economically, but also in terms of ethnicity. Um, there's a few examples because I'm studying journalism. Right. So George Alagaya, Clive Myrie. Um, but in the larger scale of journalism, there aren't really people who you can see who have kind of worked their way up, non, not through the kind of elitist university system. Um, and f my big thing was that it's not just about kind of changing the face <laughs> of characters. Maybe you'll see examples that will try and kind of encourage people through James Bond and things like that. They'll change the character to maybe a black character. But okay. in my experience, it's just by kind of changing the color of the paint from black to white. It doesn't actually do much. You need to kind of change the story behind that. Mm -hmm. You need to change um, the theme from this kind of hyper-masculine colonialist character to somebody who encourages diversity, somebody who encourages people from different backgrounds to want to get into the industry. Um, and without that, I don't think you can kind of get or encourage other people to get into the industry. So do you feel a responsibility? Because you know that yeah. how far you go in your career, mm -hmm. there's going to be young men and women just yeah. like you, yeah. who will hopefully be looking up to you. Is exactly. that the aim? That's the point, because it's, it's all right. well and good giving us, the bursary students, yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a chance to get through. Um, but the large majority of the population obviously don't get a chance to do this. So to have, give them a role model to understand that this side of the world isn't that hostile, isn't that kind of this dangerous world when you step into the door, you're not kind of scared, people aren't that right. mean, people are lovely. Um, so <laughs> they to kind are, of, yeah, by exactly. Large. <laughs> um, so, and then people, if they see you there, they kind of understand, oh, well, this actually is an opportunity for me. Um, sure. Because before the RTS scheme, journalism and television wasn't really an opportunity for me. Um, it was more just kind of maybe print writing, yeah, it's yeah. more traditional. But now seeing that this industry is something that kind of welcoming um, and hopefully is getting more, more diverse is Thank really you. positive. That's absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And Ali, you've been a big, big success. Oh, thank you. You're very ballsy. You asked your man Reid a, a question. I, I wouldn't have asked him a question. I'd be too scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So how, how did it change your life? What, the RTS? Yeah. Um, I think the RTS changed my life in a way where it came just when I needed to come. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, it inspired me because of the events that we went to. Um, because of these events, I took action and I applied it. So I started doing work with, well, first I started networking. I learned how to network and I started meeting people. Yeah. And then I started creating content with these people. I reached out to them, all of that stuff. And because of that, <coughs> I, like, I've got a good, credi a good credibility. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So 
I don't know if that answers your question. No, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Thank you, Tom. And they're fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. A credit to yourselves. And I can't wait to see what the future is going to bring for all of you. It's brilliant. Thank you very, very much indeed. Excellent. <laughs> Isn't that encouraging? So, so encouraging. It really is. It just think, you just think, yes, brilliant. Right. OK, joining me now, as I'm sure you know, Alan Clemens and Vicky Cook. Alan is the director of Glasgow-based production at Two Rivers Media. Until last year, he was director of content at STV. And Vicky's here too. Vicky Cook is Director of Content Media Policy at Ofcom. She oversees diversity in broadcasting. I'm sure you were really interested in, yeah, in hearing what great the students that. had to hear. It was, it was quite remarkable. Alan, you organised a, a session on social mobility a couple of years ago, right here at the RTS. Have we changed? Has anything changed? Have we moved on? Are there improvements? Well, I, it, it was funny to kick it off two years ago and uh, to have the Ofcom figures, to have the data finally this week. Um, I think if you can be both shocked at something but not surprised, that, that would be my reaction to it. And I think as you walk through King's College to come here, it's a slightly odd place to be talking about social mobility. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's quite intimidating, isn't it? Here, here, we, here we are, and, and like you, my family's from the Gorbals, and it's a, it's a very odd industry to be in coming from that background. Yeah. But I think <clears throat> what the, you see with these RTS bursary students and, and others in the BBC apprenticeship scheme, all of it's amazing, all of it's brilliant, we're slowly making progress, but it's nothing like enough. Right. And I think, to be honest, we have to do something much more structural in order to really change things. So how can we do that? How can we do, what can we do, all of us? I, I think that we are never going to truly solve the social mobility issue in this industry till we solve the geography issue. So if you think, for example, and Tony Hall hinted at this at his speech yesterday, if you think about the BBC, for those who actually make decisions, there is one commissioning editor at daytime, Muslim Alim in Glasgow. I think there's some uh, commissioning in Birmingham for BBC Three outside of kids. There's no other network commissioner who is not based in London. Right. ITV, Kevin Ligo and his brilliant team, they're all great but they're all in London. Mm. Sky the same. I think there's one Channel 5 commissioner outside of London. Now, Channel 4 is about to have this revolutionary step of its three bases outside of London, but that's only the first step because people follow the power and people follow the money. And if the people who sign the checks are all in London and the role models are all in London and they're all eating in the same restaurants and go to the same parties and go to the same gallery openings or whatever is that it how it works? Be, uh, <laughs> then they can't possibly know the society that they are meant to be talking to, that they're meant to be representing. Mm. So I think we have to do something much more revolutionary, much more fundamental. Would you agree with that, Vicky? Do you yeah, think totally. The way ahead. So yeah. what, what would you like to see happening? And again, you know, we had all of this um, data coming out. None of it yeah. was particularly surprising, was it? Yeah. No, it wasn't. Uh, so is that slightly depressing? Yes. Uh, but seeing it as it takes up quite a lot of my, my time, my working mm. life, uh, I always try and look at it in quite a positive way. And I think what I've heard certainly over the last couple of days, uh, Tony certainly alluded to it, as did Alex, as did Sharon White, my boss, um, when she was talking the other day, is this very, very bold approach. You know, something does need to happen now. Mm. And I don't, I'm really, really keen that we don't get diversity fatigue because we've got this, you know, I think in terms of recruiting in a very diverse way, fantastic. But I really want us to start to look at inclusion. Right. Because to me, that's what it's about. It's about culture. It's about how you change this industry. So the industry does really look and sound like the audiences it's, it's broadcasting to. Because it's brilliant to hear uh, the bursary students. And, you know, there are lots of schemes that I know of when I talk to broadcasters, when they talk about how they're, they're working and reaching out to get a more socially diverse culture. But you think if you just bring one or two people into an organization in 800, 2,000, 3,000 employees around them that don't look or sound like them, that have been to university, that do you know, sit in, I've sat in editorial meetings before where, um, you know, people have been uh, sort of spraffing in Latin and having a joke about Pericles. You oh, think, oh, <laughs> uh, exactly. So, you know, you have to, I think that to me, the focus has to be on how we really address a much more inclusive mm. culture. And as I said, that goes to succession and retention of staff. And I think the point about 
the geographical footprint is absolutely crucial. So is it then, do we do, we do things like quotas? Is that going to, do you think that's, that's going to help, Alan? Is that something that we should do? I think maybe targets rather than quotas. Okay. And, and I think I'm really interested to see how Tony's going to flesh out that move. Because actually, um, Charlotte talked about, Charlotte Moore talked about this two years ago at the Creative uh, Cities Convention in Leeds. And she said, we're going to organically start to move commissioners out. Mm. Well, there were three commissioning editors in Scotland, there's now one. So that feels like organically going the other way. Yeah. So I think maybe the BBC is going to have to be stricter about when we're advertising commissioner jobs, they're in Glasgow, they're in Leeds, they're mm. in Norwich, or wherever it might be. No. And I think that, that has to be the next step. And also mentoring is really important, isn't it? I mean, that's one of the things that when you're talking to the students last night and today, um, a lot of them are saying that that's really, really important just to get that feedback and to get that support because we all need that. I mean, I got that when I, when I was starting out. It's really amazing to have it. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of structured or anything. It was just that, oh, there was that fella that kind of helped you out. And that's what I tried to do in my job. It's not structured in my everyday job, but you, you always try, you know, don't pull the ladder away. Help yeah. people up, help yeah. people up. And we've got to maybe get that whole culture. Get you that want started. that next gen generation standing on your shoulders, <laughs> certainly as a woman in the industry. Ab absolutely, I always I mean, felt we've that. all we've all had help. Yeah, you know, maybe some more than others, perhaps. Yeah. But we all ha have had that person that we all remember. You know, that, yeah. that's helped us out. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like a whole sea change of culture, really, isn't it? Yeah. I also uh, uh, just on the quotas point, and I've said it a lot before. Yeah. I just don't agree with quotas because mm. I think it's just. It's something that gives a quick fix, and it looks yeah. like everything's fine. Well, it looks fine. good, doesn't it? It looks, it looks look, great. Look at me, I've done something. Exactly, and but then it, it falls away difference. afterwards. So targets are at least aspirational. It's right. something to focus sure. um, uh, people's minds and attention on. But you're right, it is that. It's the helping hand. It's who you can see that you can go and have a coffee with or a chat yeah. with, and just, just getting a much more loose and inclusive culture, even down to language, even how we talk to each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I've noticed here there is a different sort of language that you've yeah. got to ch tune your ear into. You know, there is a sort of, uh, as, as in all trades and all industries, they, they do do that. Yeah. Maybe we do it too much here? But I, I think there's also a, a, a cultural issue. You, you raised your Australian boss. Yes. Uh, and I went on a scholarship to the States and then worked out there. And I would never have started a company if I hadn't had the experience and the confidence that, that those four years gave me. Right. Because for people in America, they hear my accent. They don't, they don't, they don't care. They don't immediately at all. put you somewhere. And in fact, yeah. the reverse, it's a redemptive story for them. It's, you, you go from a council estate to the Ivy League. They love that because it shows the American dream is still right. alive and well. Gotcha. Whereas I don't think we really celebrate, celebrate that the same way mm. in, in British culture. No, and you almost get there despite, you know, despite these obstacles. But having said that, I mean, I do think the, the background that I've got and from where I'm from has certainly helped me to be better at the sort of job that I do. Um, and I'm not just talking about getting people from working class backgrounds, if we can still call it that, um, in front of screen. I think it's actually more important to get them into management and, and production as well, you know, that's because that's where change really, really happens, isn't yes. it? It's, yeah. it's positions of authority, positions of power. Yeah. That's the absolutely crucial thing. But no. that's what I think. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there is a chief exec certainly who has spoken at this conference, who doesn't get it mm. and who isn't committed to it. You know, that, that uh, to which me is, is great. absolutely yeah, which, which is great. Which is fantastic. And you've got, you've got the, the entry level uh, where there's an awful lot of focus and then you've got this sort of frozen middle. And that's what we need to thaw out really quickly and that's where we need to focus some attention. Yeah, and it's got to come from the top down, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course it, it, it has. It really does. Yeah. So if there was one thing you think that we could do what would it be? What would it be to make, to make a change, to make a positive change? I mean, we have been talking about this for a long time. You started it, you started the ball rolling a couple of years ago. What should we be doing? I think we have, I mean, I think, as I said, we have to be incredibly bold. I mean, I think the one thing where we can make and affect real change with this industry is to collaborate and talk and share best practice mm. and not be afraid to say, actually we had 80 initiatives that's ridiculous you need four let's concentrate on them mm. but also learn from each other i mean each you know channel four is different to channel five is different to sky we get that but in terms of how we talk to people and treat people and encourage people into the industry that is a brilliant place where we can collaborate and learn from each other no very much so that makes perfect sense doesn't it yeah i think 
for me, it's the structural change I outline, but also it's about saying to every single senior person in the industry that they should mentor someone from a hard to reach yeah. background. And if everybody in this room made that commitment today, I think that would make a massive difference. Exactly, because it's getting people who, you know, someone like myself, I never ever dreamed that I would be in, in telly, and it's almost by accident in a way, and, and it's down to that, that Australian that helped me out and, you know, gave me a bit of confidence after it had been shattered. But it's to make sure that young kids like me think, I can do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, nothing's going to stop me. I can do that. And not only I can do that, but actually it's not going to be as tough as it May, you may think, do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But again, I think that, that, you know, as Alan was saying, not to have that concentrated um, industry set in London and to have that much wider geographical mm. spread, I think, helps that. The other thing, if, if you want to fit in, just buy trainers with a big white sole, man or woman. <laughs> Is anyone. that it? Is that, I'm in yeah. the gang now. Yeah. I, just, I usually... I, I, I was, I can't trying to hide my, my feet heels, earlier, actually. The, the trouble is, I can't actually walk in them. So I thought, and I thought, I'm on a wee box. Because <laughs> Lenny Henry's next, and he's a lot taller than me. So they wanted him, you wouldn't have been able to see me if I'd not been standing on my box. So that was what that was all about. So going forward, do you feel optimistic yes. that we are going to be able to blow the doors off? Yeah. The bloody doors, even. Yeah, I do. Because, as I said, I genuinely think, you know, the... the, the leaders of the industry and the broadcast industry get it and i think there's a huge swell of 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 so no, it's, it's not anger but there's a real passion to make a difference and mm -hmm. make a change and i said hearing you know hearing stories like we've just heard and alan's idea of that sort of you know one-on-one -on -one mentoring but we have to keep talking about it and it's mm -hmm. and a lot of people say that's all you do is talk about it but you've got to keep it in the spotlight and you have to keep banging on and on and on with the same message to actually get some progress. But I, it would be fantastic, the sort of bolder uh, and more ridiculous, the ideas as to how we can, you know, put a rocket up it, then I, I would love to hear them. I think I, I want to be optimistic. Uh, yeah. I don't want to be cynical at all. Yep. But oh. the difficulty we have is it's the one prejudice you can't see. You can walk into this hall and go, there are not enough people of colour here. There are not enough women. There are shockingly few people with disabilities. However, you can't see class. Mm, yeah. And I think that's the real issue we have. And so it's, it's the hardest one to deal with because it's the hardest one to see. And I, I, I love the hints we've had this week. I love the commitments we've had this week. I really want to see the action that follows from them. I agree. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you both very much indeed. And thank you to our fantastic students too. They were amazing. Absolutely amazing, they really were. So here's hoping all of you get a chance to blow the bloody doors off because you deserve it, you really do. It just remains for me to introduce today's next session. It's all about diversity. So please welcome the chair of Mediacom UK and Ireland, Karen Blackett. Thank you guys, thank you.